Thank you, yes. We're not taking attendance, don't worry. Uh, I want to welcome you to part two of our uh, series on cardiac care, or as I like to think of it, my series dedicated to fellow Westport hypochondriacs. Uh, how, how many of you, by a show of hands, attended our first uh, evening on March 22nd? Well, that's good. Attendance taken. Uh, that, as you recall, was our, was our evening on uh, coronary uh, artery disease, uh, taming America's number one killer. Uh, a little bit of a recap of that evening. Uh, one in four deaths in the United States is due to coronary artery disease. Our doctors discussed risk factors, including cholesterol, impact on the cardiovascular disease, uh, its current management. Doctors Altbaum, Dreisman, and Pollack reviewed the presentation, management, and new technologies to treat coronary artery disease. So tonight's subject is atrial fibrillation, the most common heart rhythm disturbance. It particularly impacts our senior citizens. Remarkably, 10% of people over, is it 65 or 75? 75, over 75. Well, I'm waving at it. Uh, <laughs> those folks have, uh, that 10% that has uh, AFib. So tremendous strides have been made in the diagnosis and treatment of this. Tonight we have three very special guests uh, to talk about AFib, Dr. Robert Altbaum, you recall from last time, he's an internist and host of the series. Dr. Mitchell Dreisman, cardiologist, and Dr. Mori, I'm told now, <laughs> Cheravuri is how you're pronouncing it. Good, okay, well, I only had to do that once. Uh, he's an expert in electrophysiology and will highlight the causes, the medical complications, medical treatment, and the newest ablation uh, therapies for atrial fibrillation. Uh, one of the contributors to this evening's presentation is Cardia Mobile. It's a company that markets um, an efficient consumer tool that can scan for heart irregularities. They've donated six of these units uh, for our use tonight, and uh, hopefully they'll be owned by the, um, by the library, their, their donation, which is wonderful. Uh, so if you're inclined, you can check after the presentation. There'll be a table set up over there by John Brandt, who's waving at you. And you can, uh, if you're so brave, you can go check it out. Uh, Dr. Bob Altbaum is the host of this series. He recently retired from his practice at Internal Medicine Associates of Westport. Uh, he was a senior attending physician at Norwalk Hospital, where he currently teaches. Dr. Altbaum received his medical degree from Harvard Medical School, completed his training at Mass General and Yale New Haven Hospital. Bob will introduce our other two esteemed doctors, Dr. Dreisman and Dr. Churavuri. So now, please welcome Bob Altbaum and our wonderful panel of physicians. We'll see you in a bit. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, anyway, I just want to welcome you all to the second in a series, uh, hopefully what will be an exciting uh, discussion about atrial fibrillation. As Andrew mentioned, it's the most common cardiac abnormal heart rhythm, uh, and it affects up to 10% of the American public. Uh, our goal tonight really is to educate you about the disease, help you know, learn the symptoms, and most importantly, review some of really the astonishing uh, achievements that have occurred in treating this disease. It's really been a kind of a golden age for atrial fibrillation therapy. Uh, tonight, uh, I am privileged to have two excellent cardiologists with me, Dr. Mitchell Dreisman and Dr. Molly Turavuri. Uh, I will give an overview of atrial fibrillation, and then Dr. Turavuri will discuss the medical and the catheter-related treatments that now are involved in atrial fibrillation. In way of their background, Dr. Dreisman received his medical degree from Brown University, completed three years of residency at Tufts, and finished his cardiology training at Mount Sinai Medical Center. He is currently the head of cardiac catheterization and coronary angioplasty at Cardiac Specialist in Fairfield. Uh, Dr. Churvey also is a practicing cardiologist at Cardiac Specialist, president of the medical staff at Bridgeport Hospital, and received his medical degree at Tufts University, fulfilled his internship and residency at Brigham Hospital in Boston, and completed his cardiology and electrophysiology training at Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. He is board certified in cardiovascular disease and electrophysiology. And not to embarrass them, but if you know these institutions, these are two very impressive resumes. Uh, we are very lucky to have them tonight. So, what is atrial fibrillation? And I think the only way we could discuss atrial fibrillation is if we kind of know what the heart normally does. And the heart has basically, let's get this going here, or not. The heart is divided into four chambers. 
two upper chambers called the atrium and two lower chambers called the ventricle. And what normally happens is blood enters the right side of the heart, the right upper chamber, the atrium. It gets pumped into the lower chamber, the right ventricle, pumped to the lungs where it gets oxygenated, returns to the heart on the left side, the left atrium, gets pumped into the left ventricle, and then back out to the rest of the body. That sounds a little confusing. It's a lot to go on, and it's amazingly well coordinated. But how is it coordinated? How does the heart know to do this? It does this through an electrical system. And this is kind of an image of the electrical system. There's a little magical tissue here called the sinoatrial node, which is in the right atrium. And that generates a pulse. It's like, like a regular, regular baton. It's like a conductor is just waving his baton, and the orchestra knows what to do. It spreads through the atrium, then it goes through another little tissue called the AV node, and then into the ventricle. It starts in the right atrium, spreads to the atria, and they contract. Then it, the electrical signal goes down into the ventricle and tells the ventricles to track. When the electrical signal reaches the muscle, that's how it knows how to contract. And it's totally coordinated. If you wanted to look at this as an EKG, which you've all had, but maybe don't know what it means, this little thing over here is called a P wave. And that represents the electrical signal of the atrium. The two atrium together generate that little P wave. And then this larger signal is called the QRS, and that represents the ventricle electrically discharging. And as you can see, it's extremely regular, P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS, and that is called normal sinus rhythm. So what happens in atrial fibrillation? Well, as the name implies, something goes awry with the atrium. And what happens is that instead of this little chamber causing this very regular pulse, as over here, you get these little wavelets, little electrical wavelets all over the place. It's not one beat anymore, it's multiple beats. Uh, to use that metaphor, it's like you're suddenly in the middle of a concert and s multiple conductors suddenly walk up onto the podium, each waving their baton at a different speed. And the, the band and the orchestra has no idea what to do. It just breaks down into chaos. That's kind of what happens in the atrium. The atrium doesn't know who to follow, and instead of pumping like a regular pump, it starts to quiver or fibrillate. And that's what atrial fibrillation is. What happens is when that starts to happen, the heart is now not pumping as efficiently. The atrium really aren't pumping at all. Some of the signal is going down to the ventricle, and that does pump normally, but it's irregular, and it's not getting any of the benefit of that extra kick from the atrium pump. The end result is your heart becomes much less efficient. This is normal sinus rhythm. As I said, P wave, QRS, and then P wave, QRS. We'll forget about that because that's kind of a recharge. If anybody can find me a P wave there, I would be very impressed. That's just chaos. That's like an oscilloscope just generating electrical activity. And that's what's happening in atrial fibrillation. Now, it can go on for a number of minutes, days, years. If it goes on for less than a week and it goes back to normal rhythm, we call that paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. If it lasts more than a week and we have to kind of help it along electrically or through medication, we call it persistent. And if it goes on for greater than a year, it's called permanent. Although these terms are getting very gray now because we have treatments that almost make their terminology less important. Permanent can now become back to normal sinus rhythm, which is one of the things Dr. Churi Vuri will bring up. The important epidemiology, six million Americans have atrial fibrillation, 2% of people younger than 65, but 10% of people older than 65 to 75. It's responsible for 500,000 hospitalizations annually, and it contributes to 160,000 deaths annually in the United States. But I guarantee you, every one of you knows somebody who's had atrial fibrillation, and it's just that common. So why does it even happen? Well, it happens for a variety of reasons, but to give you just kind of an overview, the electrical activity of the heart, this sinus node where it all is generated, is sensitive to any stressor. So if something stretches it or deprives it of oxygen or infects it or stimulates it too much like a medication, it can go off and suddenly you get these multiple wavelets causing atrial fibrillation. One way I like to think about it is you start at the outside of the heart and you just work in anything that affects the outside. The heart is covered by a tissue called pericardium, 
if that pericardium gets inflamed, you can get atrial fibrillation. If the arteries get blocked, the, the area doesn't get enough oxygen, the atrium becomes starved for oxygen, it starts to fibrillate. And basically, you have a heart that isn't working. You can start on the inside, the muscle. During uh, COVID, you got myocarditis, that's inflammation of the muscle. That can cause inflammation and cause atrial fibrillation. One of the valves can go, be, you know, get blocked or they can get stop working and that causes atrial fibrillation. So things in the heart cause it, but other things outside the heart can irritate the heart. So a very common thing that irritates the heart, and again, I won't say how many people have it, but if I ask for a show of hands, sleep apnea. You turn to four or five people over the age of 65, one of them's got sleep apnea. That puts a stress on the heart at night and that can cause the heart to go into atrial fibrillation. Pulmonary embolus, a blood clot to the heart. Thyroid hormone is a stimulant to the heart. And probably the one that everybody does a little bit is alcohol. Alcohol in moderation may be okay, but there's a thing called holiday heart where people go out and really party up and they go into atrial fibrillation because the uh, alcohol acts as a direct toxin to the atrial muscle tissue and stimulates it. Cocaine does that. And one of the things that's always been controversial uh, right now, it's not felt to be a major contributor, I'd be curious what Dr. Chiraveri says, is caffeine. Caffeine used to be felt to be a very common cause of atrial fibrillation. If you have one cup of coffee, it's 100 milligrams of caffeine. If you have one dente from Starbucks, it's about 180 milligrams of caffeine. If you have three or four of those a day, you are having a lot of caffeine, but it's still controversial whether it causes it. And finally, one last thing that does contribute is just the aging process. As we age, our heart muscles develop scar tissue and they have deterioration and they can go into atrial fibrillation, which is why it's so common in people over the age of 80. So why do we even care about atrial fibrillation? What's the big deal? So your heart quivers a little bit, it's still pumping, the ventricles are still working, you still have a blood pressure, but you can imagine it's not working efficiently. It's working, your heart is pumping irregularly and rapidly. And the atrium that push the blood efficiently into the lower chamber aren't doing their job. So blood can back up in the lungs and you can get short of breath. Blood may not get pumped out to the body as efficiently and you're gonna get fatigued and tired. You may even faint. If the heart goes very, very rapidly, it can strain the heart and you get chest pain. Theoretically, it could even cause a heart attack. But these are all common symptoms that worrisome and the most common symptom probably is simply you feel it. It palpitates and it's a lousy feeling. Your heart is happening right now. It's going 60, 70 times a minute. It's totally under your awareness. But when you go into atrial fibrillation, suddenly you become aware that your heart is skipping, stopping, going quickly. It's a very unpleasant feeling. You combine those all together, it's a very uncomfortable thing to have. But that's not why we really worry about it. The reason we worry about it is because of this little thing here called an atrial appendage. This is your atrium, this is just one chamber, and that's the ventricle, atrium, ventricle. And that little chamber, remember the atrium isn't pumping, it's not pushing blood. Well, if it's not pushing blood, it's just quivering, it's just fibrillating, and the blood just sits where it sits, it just stays there. Put blood in a test tube, it wants to clot, and then you develop a clot. So you get a little clot in this app appendage, and it's right in the middle of the circulation. If you're a clot, what do you want to do? You want to move. And what happens? You get dislodged into the circulation and you travel to some unpleasant organ. In this case, the most common clot formed in the heart, travels through the heart, goes to the blood, and lands up in the brain. And it is a very, very common and unfortunate cause of stroke. And that's really one of our major concerns. It also causes many other things, atrial fibrillation. It can cause heart failure, blackouts, as I mentioned, but this is the most feared because once you've had a stroke, it's, it's really tough to reverse. And these are some of the relevant statistics. The most important thing is that the presence of atrial fibrillation increases your risk of stroke about five times. And 20% of strokes could be attributed to a clot from the heart called a cardioembolus, and that's attributed to atrial fibrillation. So it's a very important thing. Fortunately, Dr. Churaviri will talk about ways we can prevent that from happening. This is not in any way an inevitability. And finally, how do we diagnose it? Well, we diagnose it first, you, we diagnose it because you start feeling 
palpitations. And what are you gonna do? You're gonna hopefully call your physician and he can do a cardiogram. Another way to diagnose it is with modern technology that we all walk around with, like an Apple, wa an Apple Watch. And Apple Watches actually do work. And we have some other devices via LifeCore that you can use after the discussion that, that you can all test to see. It turns out 10% of people who have atrial fibrillation don't even know they have it. They don't feel it. And they can be walking around with the disease that is a potential cause of stroke. So it's a very important thing to be aware of. And finally, we have other devices that can monitor the heart for much longer periods. An EKG is like 30 seconds. We have a Holter monitor. It's a day. We have a two-week monitor. We have a month monitor. And now we have something that you can pop under the pectoral muscle of the breast. It's a little chip and can measure things for a year, two years. And it always can record. And you can pick up atrial fibrillation that comes and goes, that term we use, paroxysmal. Finally, once you have the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, you want to look at the structure of the heart, what's wrong with it. You might do an echocardiogram, bounce sound waves off the heart, and see what it looks like. You might do a stress test. You might do a sleep study, because a lot of people, as I mentioned, with atrial fibrillation have sleep apnea. And you can manage these diseases and then manage the atrial fibrillation. And then there are a number of blood tests that you also want to get thyroid, potassium, some other tests that might fill out the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. But when you're looking at people, and you're looking now at 6 million people, soon to be 20 million by, 30, by 2030, that have atrial fibrillation, this is a monster disease in terms of frequency and an extremely important disease to treat. So I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Churavuri, and he can tell us how it's treated. Thanks a lot, Bob. Um, so that was a really nice summary by Dr. Altbaum. And um, it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk about what's really an extraordinarily prevalent, as you heard, medical condition. And it really is the most common arrhythmia that we're treating nowadays. So what I wanted to do was sort of break this down into three parts. First, we'll talk a little bit about the general medical treatment for atrial fibrillation, and then I was going to talk about the atrial fibrillation ablation procedure, which is really a first-line therapy nowadays for atrial fibrillation, and finally talk about some new technology, namely the Watchman procedure, which... Oh, thanks. Thanks. And actually, do I need to cue my slides? There we go. And then finally, we'll talk about the Watchman procedure, which is, again, this new technology and is extraordinarily useful in preventing strokes in folks who can't tolerate anticoagulation. So I think I'm sort of repeating a lot of uh, what Dr. Altbaum said on this slide, but I do think it's really important to reiterate a couple of points. First of all, okay, we know it's extraordinarily prevalent. But just remember, a lot of patients don't have symptoms. In fact, about a third of patients have no idea they're in atrial fibrillation, even if their heart's going super fast and misbehaving, so to speak. And one of the important things to remember is that even if you don't have symptoms, you're still at risk for all the adverse outcomes that are possible with atrial fibrillation, just as the symptomatic people are. And finally, we talked about going a little upstream and talking about what predisposes and makes people susceptible to atrial fibrillation. And this is really important in my opinion because before we treat the condition, prevention is always the best medicine. And there are some modifiable and there are some non-modifiable risk factors. You're not gonna change your family history, your genes are something you were born with, but there are modifiable risk factors, namely obesity, inactivity, both of which significantly increase the risk of atrial fibrillation, sleep apnea, as you heard. If you don't treat sleep apnea with CPAP, you have a higher risk of getting atrial fibrillation, alcohol use. I sort of smile because there was a Norwegian study that looked at alcohol, it was called a Hunt study, and it was very reassuring. They actually needed more than 14 drinks a week to increase the risk of atrial fibrillation, but we know that's not true. It's, <laughs> if only. Um, so all of these potential upstream risk factors should first be addressed. Start there and see if this can modify your risk of atrial fibrillation because there are 
adverse outcomes with atrial fibrillation. Yes, it's super prevalent, but it is associated with a five-fold increased risk of stroke, as you heard. It also significantly increases your risk of heart failure. It increases your risk of hospitalization, increases your risk of dementia, all-cause mortality. In fact, even renal failure, all of these are, are, have a higher incidence in people who have atrial fibrillation. So let's talk about first-line therapies for atrial fibrillation. You're newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. What do we offer you in terms of medication? And amongst the first agents we choose are these relatively light medications that I think many of you are familiar with, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. These are medications that sort of slow down the heart. They don't prevent atrial fibrillation per se or fix atrial fibrillation, but they modulate and slow down the heart rate and also can prevent some of the triggering extra heartbeats that may lead to atrial fibrillation. The other interesting procedure that we do is called a cardioversion. Again, I'm sure many of you have heard of this. Somebody comes in with a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, and we don't know if this is something that they're going to have if we could just reset them back to normal rhythm. Maybe they'll just stay in normal rhythm, and that's what the cardioversion is. So pardon the metaphor, but think of it as sort of a rebooting of your computer, which is what you do is you put a pad in the front, a pad in the back of the person, you deliver a jolt of energy, and what you're doing is you're depolarizing every cell in the atrium. You're just turning the cells off. And that allows the sinoatrial node to come back and start beating normally again. But again, it's just a reboot. You haven't done anything to the hardwiring. So is it possible that you could just go right back into atrial fibrillation at some point? Yes, exactly. That's what can happen. And the cardioversion is not a permanent fix, so to speak. And then the other issue is anticoagulation. And this is a critical aspect, as you heard, because the most feared complication of atrial fibrillation is a stroke. Now, when we decide who to put on blood thinners, we actually assign a score to the patient or to the person. And we look to see if they have other risk factors, congestive heart failure, hypertension, and age over 65, more so if it's over 75, diabetes, stroke, female sex, vascular disease, a history of a heart attack. We then, each one of those gives you points. And if you accumulate sufficient points, you warrant being on a blood thinner because that's going to protect you from having a stroke. <clears throat> but let's just say you have atrial fibrillation and you don't have a single risk factor, none of the above. We call that lone atrial fibrillation. Well, guess what? You actually don't have to be on a blood thinner because the risk benefit is not sufficient uh, to, to justify that. So let's say you have been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation and the preliminary therapies, be they a cardioversion or these light drugs I mentioned, the beta blockers or the calcium channel blockers, don't fix the problem. Well, we have other medications that are a little more potent than the ones I've mentioned, and we refer to these as antiarrhythmic medications. And there are multiple different classes and medications that we can choose from. These medications, just so that you know, are almost always what we call channel blockers. Think about this. You have your atrial cells. They're fibrillating. They're beating three to 400 times a minute. They're going on, off, on, off, on, off. So what these drugs are doing is, and the way they go on and off is by moving sodium and potassium, and I won't go into the weeds here, but they're basically, these ions are going back and forth through little pores called channels. What these drugs do is they block those channels. So think of this as a light switch going on and off, on and off, and you make that switch really sticky. It's going to be hard to turn it on and off. That's how these drugs make it hard for you to go into atrial fibrillation. But there are some significant nuances that you should be aware of. First of all, if you have certain conditions, if you have a history of heart failure, if you have a history of coronary artery disease, there are several drugs that we can use. If, for example, you have liver problems or kidney problems and can't excrete these medications, they can be an issue as well. Some of these medications work very well in some people, and they keep the patients out of atrial fibrillation, but guess what? Sometimes people don't tolerate the medication. They can have side effects. Furthermore, these medications aren't that efficacious. You can have breakthrough atrial fibrillation in spite of these uh, medications. 
And I just put down some names of these medications so you can be aware of them. So for example, propafenone, flaconides are sodium channel blockers, sodalol, ticus, and amiodarone, maltac, these are potassium channel blockers. So if you hear these in your travels or with people you know, these are antiarrhythmic medications. Now, that takes us to ablation of atrial fibrillation. And this is now moving away from the pills or the medications to actually dealing with the problem at source, so to speak. This is not something I found in the Long Island Sound. That's actually your left atrium as viewed from the back, from the posterior aspect. Medications don't fix anything inside. They mask the problem. I told you, they're, they're channel blockers. So they make it hard for you to go into atrial fibrillation. But again, you're not fixing the hard wiring underneath. So what is the source of atrial fibrillation? These little structures that you see, these two on this side and two on this side, these are the pulmonary veins. You've heard about this from Dr. Altbaum. So basically, these are the pipes that return oxygenated blood from the lungs back to your left atrium. And it turns out that atrial fibrillation, particularly in the earlier stages, paroxysmal AFib, that means you've just been diagnosed, you're going in and out of it, almost in most cases, almost all the atrial fibrillation triggers come from where these pulmonary veins enter the left atrium. That junction point is where this atrial fibrillation is emanating from. I will say, though, that things change. If you start spending years in atrial fibrillation, the substrate starts to change. No longer is the focus, the nidus of atrial fibrillation in just this one little area where the pulmonary veins meet the left atrium, but it starts to become more of a diffuse problem when you are more persistent. In other words, if you spend years and decades in atrial fibrillation, it's not so localized. It's much more of a diffuse problem and affects more of the atrium. Okay, so we now know that at least in the majority of people that we want to treat, we've localized this problem to the pulmonary veins. And the way this happens in this schematic that you see over here is that, is there a pointer? one in front of me, okay. Um, so what you have over here is you have these pulmonary veins, and here's the deal. We don't really care if there's fibrillatory activity going on in a pulmonary vein. These are non-contractile structures. The problem is, is that these pulmonary veins are electrically connected to the left atrium. So if they start fibrillating, these signal signals escape and cause every part of the left atrium to fibrillate as well. So what if we just created a little barrier, a little scar around the vein so that these abnormal signals cannot escape? Well, that's actually the bedrock of the atrial fibrillation ablation procedure, is to localize these signals and prevent them from coming into the left atrium. How do we do that? Well, we do this atrial fibrillation ablation procedure percutaneously which means we basically go through the blood vessels. We introduce a little catheter into the vein, the femoral vein. And here it just shows a single stick. We actually put a, a number of pieces of equipment through the veins up to the level of the heart. And what we do is we go through the inferior vena cava, that's sort of in your, in your, through your abdomen, up into the right atrium. We go through this little membrane called the interatrial septum. And then notice what we do. We put a multipole catheter with multiple electrodes at the orifice of the vein. And we use our ablation catheter, shown here in blue with this glowing tip, by the way, it doesn't glow, um, which delivers radio frequency energy to the tissue that it touches. And this causes resistive heating and ultimately a thermally mediated necrosis so that it causes a little scar. Very, very fine. If somebody were to do an echocardiogram on you after the ablation, Oh, sorry, a necrosis cell death. Um, basically, you're causing the, a little bit of scar, a little bit uh, of, of these cells that surround the pulmonary vein. 
And what that means is it renders that tissue electrically non-conductive. So we've created a little insulation barrier around here. It's actually pretty interesting because, if I may say, because what you have here is these multipole electrodes um, here. And when we start the ablation, we can activate the vein and all the signals come out. We activate the atrium, all the signals go in. There's free communication. But when we're done, you can stimulate the vein and none of those signals come back out. Exit block. And when you stimulate the atrium, none of the signals can go into the vein. Entrance block. So now when you have that bidirectional block, which we can demonstrate electrically, we know that we've damned the area, so to speak, and none of these signals can now escape. What I've shown you here is radio frequency energy using a linear catheter. So we're putting a series of dots around the pulmonary vein origin, and that creates a, a little barrier, electrically, uh, an electrical barrier that prevents the signals from coming out. But as you can imagine, that's not the most sort of efficient way to do it. If you had a little pipe, so to speak, and with an orifice, and you wanted to basically create a circle around that, how would you do it? Would you do it with little point ablations? Or maybe what you'd do is you'd put a collapsible balloon right into it and then inflate the balloon so that it's right up against that orifice, and now you would have a perfect circle when you introduce the energy. So to prove that point, we're gonna show you a movie. Um, if you guys wanted to play the movie, and I'll just walk you through this. So this is the cryo balloon, okay? And this is something we do a lot of procedures using this technology. We used to use only radio frequency, but now, we use a lot of this cryoablation. So this is how it works. What we do is we take this multipole electrode, as I showed you earlier, we put it inside at the or orifice of the, uh, the vein. You can see those electrical signals. And then what happens is over that wire, so to speak, we put this balloon, we then inflate it, and this balloon is then fit snugly up against the vein. So it's sort of blocking the vein. The blood can't return. We've sealed it. Then what we do is we inject a little bit of dye. And what we know now we've occluded because this dye can't escape through the edges. We know we've got a seal. We do this with fluoroscopy. And then what we do is we basically start to introduce a coolant into this balloon and freeze. And what you're seeing here is the signals that we actually pay a lot of attention to because the loss of those signals means that we've isolated the vein. So this just shows you that it's cooling. And once it's done cooling and freezing, it takes literally about 180 seconds for us to achieve isolation. And then what we do is we collapse this balloon and now you see this perfect ring, freeze ring, where we've created a scar, and now the signals can't escape or enter the vein. Again, we've done the same thing. We've isolated the pulmonary vein. And amongst a lot of the physicians that do this, that's what we call it. We call it a pulmonary vein isolation procedure. There's some new technology coming that you may have heard about, and this is called pulse field ablation. This is a technology that, unlike the resistive heating that I mentioned, radio frequency, or the cryoablation, which is the freezing. This actually uses a whole different approach, which is, uh, some of you may be familiar with, it's a, it's a process called electroporation. And what you're doing here is you're delivering high amplitude current at a high frequency very, very quickly, and creating little pores, little holes. You're punching little holes into the cells. It turns out through a quirk of nature that cardiomyocytes, heart cells, are uniquely sensitive to this. So you can damage the cells of the heart, which you sort of want to do in just this one little area, and these cells can, you know, can necrose, can uh, form a scar without this happening to any surrounding tissue. So it uniquely affects cardiac cells. It doesn't affect the cells that surround the heart. So there's the, the risk of collateral damage goes down significantly, and it's also a lot more efficient. There's no thermal, there's no heating or cooling that can affect 
other areas. This is not FDA approved yet, but in my opinion, it's going to be approved, I believe, by the end of the year. Now, there are some problems with pulse field ablation because in some cases, we actually do want a little bit of a far field effect. And for example, there's some of the autonomic nervous system that's in the heart that is affected by radio frequency ablation and cryo ablation. And we like that to happen, and that doesn't happen with the pulse field ab ablation. So there's no clear free lunch. I don't think this is going to replace cryoablation, but we will have this choice. And it looks like we're probably going to be amongst the first users of this uh, technology. But just remember, everything I've shown you, it's doing the same thing. We're isolating the pulmonary veins. That's where the signals tend to come from with atrial fibrillation. Whether we're using pulse field, cryoablation, radio frequency, we're trying to achieve the same thing. If people have atrial fibrillation even after this, we do take them back and do ablation where we address more of the areas. Like I told you, some people have more advanced atrial fibrillation, and we have to go to more places inside the atrium. And this is the location, sort of this is how it looks like, where we do these procedures. And what you can see is we have multiple technologies available to us. We have fluoroscopy where we can see through the patient. We also have 3D mapping. We have intracardiac ultrasound. And we also, probably most importantly, are looking at all the electro electrical signals within the atria and the ventricles. So there's a lot of information that we have that is at our disposal to see exactly what's going on inside. There's not much left to the imagination. Now, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the role of pacemakers in atrial fibrillation, in particularly treating atrial fibrillation. Look, there are some people who are pretty far advanced with atrial fibrillation, so much so that they have a lot of scar, a lot of uh, remodeling of their atria, and so they're just not going to succeed with ablation because their heart just is so used to AFib, it's going to keep going back into atrial fibrillation. Furthermore, there's some people who can't tolerate the anesthesia or the whole procedure due to frailty or other medical conditions. And for these people, the so-called pacemaker and AV node ablation is an option. And here's what it, what's involved here, is what we, if you think about it, as Dr. Altbaum said, the atria are connected to the ventricles to so is one choke point. It's called the AV node. So if you got rid of that AV node, the atria are not going to be talking to the ventricles. So the atrium can fibrillate all at once, but of course there's a problem because the ventricle is not going to do anything and that wouldn't be good. So you put a pacemaker first, and you have a pacemaker lead into the ventricle. And then what we do is we ablate the AV node. It takes about 15 minutes. Now what you've done is you've disconnected the atrium and the ventricle. So the heart's never going to beat super fast when you have atrial fibrillation. But what the pacemaker will do is pace the ventricle. Now, you're still in atrial fibrillation. The atrium is still fibrillating, but your heart rate is very well controlled. There are a couple of issues, which is if you really aren't doing well because of the atrial fibrillation, not because of the fast heart rate, you're still going to be in the same position because you're still in atrial fibrillation. And number two, just remember, you are now pacemaker dependent. Not a big deal in our experience, and we've, you know, we've performed a lot of pacemaker procedures. These things are incredibly reliable, but you are pacemaker dependent. So for example, you have to be a little careful. You don't want to get an infection in some other part of your body that might ultimately affect this pacemaker because you're pacemaker dependent. And if we did take it out, we'd have to put a new one in. So this brings to me to the, the last section of this talk, which is to talk about this newer technology, the so-called Watchman. Uh, procedure, which is something we've been doing a lot of uh, over the last few years. Again, I think we've really belabored the point that atrial fibrillation increases your risk of stroke. I think you all get it. And of course, this is a cardioembolic phenomenon, right? The atrium is not squeezing. It's not transporting the blood. It's fibrillating. There's stasis. When blood is still, it forms clots. These clots in the atria can dislodge, get into the bloodstream, plug an artery in the brain, all the tissue in the brain downstream of that obstruction is now going to die a stroke. Nothing's going to change a person's life like a stroke. So the best way to treat a stroke is to avoid one. Here's the deal. We talked about the appendage. In, except for some very unusual circumstances, something called mitral stenosis, in the vast majority of people who have atrial fibrillation, when clots form in the atrium, they form in the appendage. 
over 98%, the vast majority, and this is what it looks like, by the way. You see this little clot? That's an ultrasound picture showing a little thrombus clot in the left atrial appendage, which looks quite menacing, because if that is dislodged and gets into your circulation, it's going to embolize, it's going to go somewhere, unfortunately, very often to the brain, and plug up an artery. So to prevent these strokes from occurring, we put people on blood thinners. And what these blood thinners do is they prevent clots from forming in the left atrial appendage. And these are some of the anticoagulants I think you're all very familiar with. There's warfarin. And does anybody know where the word warfarin comes from? It's the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, warfarin, true story. Um, it was actually first approved as a rodenticide, um, but I digress. Um, that's warfarin. And then the, more, the newer agents, Eliquis, Xarelto, Pradaxa, and less used Savesa are all anticoagulants. But again, think about this. You're trying to prevent a clot from forming in this one little area of the heart, the appendage, and yet you're giving medication that potentially can affect you from head to toe. And that can be a problem because there are some people who have significant bleeding events when you put them on blood thinners. GI bleeds, for example. There are some people who are unstable on their feet and can fall and hurt themselves when they're on a blood thinner and cause not just trauma, but trauma with a blood thinner, which can be more severe. There are some people who have a high risk of trauma based on what they do for a living and wouldn't be the best candidates to be on a blood thinner going forward. There are some people who are just intolerant to the medication itself. And finally, you know, this is a real issue, is access especially cost. These medications are phenomenal, the newer anticoagulants, but they are so expensive. Unfortunately, I think we've all seen patients who literally will not take their medication or try and parse it out, rendering it ineffective because they can't afford it. So that brings us to the watchman. So again, we know that these thrombi tend to form in this one little part of the heart called the left atrial appendage. So instead of putting them people on blood thinners that affect them from head to toe, why don't we just plug that left atrial appendage? Well, that's exactly what the watchman is. As you can see, looking at the structure here, it's got a framework made of a nitinol alloy. It's covered by this fabric. It's called PET. Um, it's polyethylene terephthalate, in case you're wondering. 160 micron pores. And it comes in different sizes. And the goal of this device is to essentially obstruct or to wall off this appendage so that clots can form there and subsequently embolize or spread to the rest of the circulation or the body. This has been, uh, this was first tried in human patients over a decade ago. And there's a ton of data with this device showing that it's just as good as being on a blood thinner in terms of stroke prevention, and yet, obviously, you have a much lower bleeding risk. So I'm going to show you a movie about how this is implanted. Here we go. So this is the Watchman device. Again, like I said, it's made up of this nitinol alloy framework. We start in the femoral vein. It's a single, single sheath. And through that, we introduce what we call a transeptal needle and catheter. We go all the way up the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. We go into the interatrial septum. We cross that septum. It's called a transeptal approach. We then take this little wire, stick it out the pulmonary vein, exchange the sheath for this watchman sheath, and now we take something called a pigtail catheter, stick it into the appendage, okay? And once we have the sheath there, we inject some dye. They didn't show that. But once we do that and we demonstrate that everything is good, we then deploy this Watchman device, which has now sealed this appendage. It's now endothelialized. Your own cells cover it up so that it essentially is walled off now. This appendage is no longer communicating with the atrium. So it's not a problem anymore. And our experience has been excellent. The 
hundreds of thousands of these devices have been implanted, the success rates are, are really good, uh, close to 100%. The Complication rates, uh, knock on wood, are extraordinarily low. In fact, the major adverse event uh, is a fraction of a percent. Unfortunately, we've had an even lower than that event rate. And the vast majority of people that undergo this Watchman procedure are able to come off anticoagulation. Usually what we do is we keep them on anticoagulation for about 45 days, we repeat an echo, make sure everything looks perfect as we anticipate, and then we take them off the blood thinners. They end up going on something different. It's a baby aspirin and Plavix, and then ultimately just baby aspirin. So I'll stop there, but again, thank you for your attention. Oh, Andrew is going to come up. That to me is amazing. I've been 40 years ago, this, none of this existed, and it's just astonishing what can be done now. Uh, how, many, how many people have been taking their pulse? I know I have. Uh, I want to thank these wonderful doctors here. Dr. Dreisman, do you have anything to uh, opine about? Well, a few questions for you. Phenomenal discussion, as always. Um, one of the... It was on? Couldn't hear me. Um, one of the points I think would be worth two points worth highlighting. What percentage of people with atrial fibrillation, the first presentation is a stroke? And how catastrophic is that? What's the statistic? That's a great point, uh, Mitch. So, you know, if you look back at the data, this is a, a very concerning uh, point. We call strokes that we don't know the origin of, we call them cryptogenic strokes. So, for example, if people don't have a blockage in the blood vessels that lead to the brain or have some other obvious uh, cause of a stroke, we call them cryptogenic strokes. It turns out that if you have monitored these people with cryptogenic strokes subsequent to their strokes, a very significant proportion, up to 40% of them, turn out to have had atrial fibrillation, and it's just that nobody detected it, and they were in that asymptomatic group. So even for the people who don't have atrial fibrillation, if you've had a stroke, there's a very good chance it was AFib that was the cause. And when we see patients in the office with AFib who are symptomatic, we say, how lucky are you? Yes. Or if yes. it's picked up by an internist like Bob, Good when point. Bob was an internist, we say, how lucky are you? Because right. the people who have asymptomatic atrial fibrillation, those are the ones we don't know about, but we really worry about. That's a great point. We don't want you guys to have symptoms, but by golly, it's sometimes a good thing because at least you know that you have the condition. Second point, talk about anticoagulation even after ablation, the difference between ablation and watchman. Yeah, that's an important point. So. When you think of the ablation procedure, the ablation procedure is designed to treat the atrial fibrillation. It is not designed to take you off anticoagulation. Success rates are excellent with ablation. They're not perfect, they're not 100%, but they're very high and they're higher than they've ever been before and much higher than medication, but it's not 100%. So for example, if you had a high risk score, the risk score I mentioned, and you have an ablation, and even if your chance of atrial fibrillation is very low, we would still not want you off the blood thinner. So for example, if we had somebody who their main issue was simply to come off anticoagulation, the ablation is not the right way to go, it's the watchman. And I think that's an important point. It's two different, it's what you're trying to achieve in the setting of atrial fibrillation. Last question, when, and that's the question patients are always asking, when do you go with the antiarrhythmics? Not beta blockers or cal calcium antagonists, but the real type, the sodium channel blockers, the potassium channel blockers, or when do you move to ablation? Right, and that's such an important point because it comes up all the time. And you know, data has shown that I think our practice needs to change a little bit, and it has changed already for, for many of us, in a couple of aspects. First of all, the earlier you treat atrial fibrillation, the more likely you are to succeed. You saw what I showed you, which is it tends to be a localized phenomenon and it becomes more diffuse. It's so much easier and more effective to treat it while it's a localized phenomenon before it's spread to the whole atrium. So being very aggressive up front, in my opinion, is much better. And the second issue is the ablation. That used to be sort of, hey, you failed medication and then you'd go for ablation. That paradigm has changed. In the national guidelines now consider ablation a first-line therapy. In the last six months, a whole number of uh, studies have come out showing that when people were ablated for AFib versus treated just with medications, the outcomes were dramatically different. The people who were ablated early lived longer, the mortality was higher, they were hospitalized less, they got into heart failure less. So 
ablation really has come to the fore in terms of a first-line therapy. Starting somebody on an antiarrhythmic is very reasonable to do if they're staying out of atrial fibrillation and it works. For those 40% of people, totally fine. But if they break through, don't tolerate the medication, don't take the medication, ablation is certainly a very reasonable way to go. And I think that's such an important point to highlight. It's really been an evolution. I've been practicing here 40 years, but even in the last two years, certainly five years, but the last two years, we've moved from beta blockers, antiarrhythmics, clearly moved to ablation because, number one, your techniques are so much better. The ever going from cryo ablation, from you know, heat to cold, and now with the newer electrical, the techniques are so much better and so much less dangerous with less issues related to the esophagus. And the realization that if we catch people earlier, we do much better. You want them in the paroxysmal stage rather than the um, chronic stage. Let's leave it. So let's Wait. open it to the. We're, uh, we're going to do some questions uh, and answers uh, over where the lights just came up. That'd be great. Thank so you. So if you have any questions, please come to this microphone so those people watching from home can actually hear your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all this great information. Uh, so I've had AFib for decades. Uh, I'm 77. My resting heart rate is 38. Uh, I do something active every day. I'm never out of breath. I don't know what other symptoms are supposed to be. Nothing impedes my activity. So I'm wondering, am I a candidate? So parent, based on my age, I have a score of two, I guess, of being 77. So am I a candidate for the watchman, or would you recommend something else, or say, so far, so good? <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, thank you for that uh, very appropriate question. You know, first of all, you've just sort of hit it on the nail when you talked about your heart rate. You're, 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 you're in good shape. Your heart rate's well controlled. There is a subset of patients who have atrial fibrillation who have very good heart rate control and don't suffer any negative side effects from the atrial fibrillation. And as you said, you've been in atrial fibrillation for a long time. So, hey, you're doing great. Now, in terms of the watchman, I presume you're on a blood thinner? No, I'm phobic about Bleed <laughs> okay. Bleed. Well, also, you know, I mean, I'm active and I have fallen off my bike. I've fallen yes. running. Not a lot, but it happens. You know? So, so the, here's, the, here's the rub on that, which is your risk of a stroke is not super high, but it's not zero. So when you think about a stroke risk that's between 2 and 3% per year, which is what it presumably is from what you've told us about your history, don't forget that's compounded. That's every year. And when we think of the risk being a stroke, no percentage is, is, is too low for us. And so my recommendation to you would 100% be to, you know, nothing's going to change your life like a stroke. And unfortunately, we've seen this happen many times. We, I would certainly recommend that you do something to mitigate your stroke risk. And to your point, if you're riding your bike and stuff, we don't want you on a blood thinner. So absolutely, a watchman is something to at least consider because then you don't have to be on a blood thinner for the rest of your life. Does the watchman impede your heart's... Uh ability to, you know, to exercise? No, in fact, it... not at all. So there's no activity restriction. There's no effect on the transport of blood or anything like that when you're in atrial fibrillation. Okay, thank you. I just want to be clear that I understood what you said, but like when you were talking about the ablation and how important that is versus um, cardioversion, is that just totally different? Yeah, so a cardioversion, again, like I said, is you're just resetting the heart. You put a pad in the front and the back, and you're just turn, depolar, you know, turning off every atrial cell so your heart can come back to normal. So, for example, Dr. Alpa mentioned some reversible causes. For example, let's just say your thyroid function happens to be totally off, and you have a thyroid problem. I'm just saying. That's the sort of, we knew there was a reversible cause, but hey, guess what? They're in atrial fibrillation. That's where a cardioversion might be reasonable. You just reset them, you fix the upstream problem, and now let's see how they do. That's a cardioversion. But if somebody who has, you know, atrial fibrillation that's lasting for a long time or having recurrent atrial fibrillation or having sequelae from the atrial fibrillation, bad outcomes, this, the cardioversion is not a permanent or even a long-lasting solution, because you haven't fixed anything inside. What's to stop you from going back into AFib? And that's where the ablation comes. Okay, thank you. 
Hi, I, I was an asymptomatic, um, and um, an EKG caught that I was in AFib. I had, um, I, it didn't seem to affect me. I didn't know I had it. And I immediately had um, a catheter ablation of the heart. And uh, I'm on Eliquis, and I'm on Metropolol for, um, I don't know what that's for, but I'm on those two drugs. And um, my question is, is there any activity uh, that I shouldn't do to uh, keep myself uh, in right rhythm? Well, first of all, it sounds like you're doing quite well. And the data actually shows that activity helps keep you in normal rhythm. Um, and I think that's been true for almost everything related to medicine and cardiology is that activity is so much better than inactivity. So you don't have any restrictions except for the fact that you're on a blood thinner. But in, when you say activity, I presume you mean physical activity? Uh, I play a lot of tennis. <laughs> we love it. We love it. We, 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 the more activity you do, the better. And, you know, and that applies to endurance activity, strength training activity. Data has shown over and over again that the more activity you do, the better you will do from an AFib standpoint as well. Why did the doctor put me on metoprolol? So metoprolol is a beta blocker, as you know, and it does a couple of things. It, number one, it reduces your resting heart rate, but most importantly, it blocks these extra heartbeats that you can have. So let's just say, for example, somebody cuts you off on 95, that first startle you have, that fight flight, the, the, that adrenergic reaction causes your heart to beat a little faster, can have an extra heartbeat, that can sometimes actually trip you into something a little more significant, such as an episode of atrial fibrillation. Think of it as a very light preventative drug. Um, <clears throat> the cost of Eliquis, I get it from the VA hospital. It costs me next to nothing. So That's fantastic. And I think, the, God bless the VA, we have a very good experience with them as well. Right. But unfortunately, it, you know, it, it does cost a lot for the people who don't have it covered. I had this procedure done at U Penn, a Dr. March Marshlinsky. Linsky. Yeah, I know. Uh, I heard that he had some sort of uh, a new procedure, and that some other doctor told me I should go down there and see him. Uh, I was wondering what the new procedure is, or how he does he do something different? <laughs> um, not, not the last I heard, but maybe it was the PFA, the pulse field ablation that I mentioned. Um, I, I don't know what, what I I'll have. You know, a few of my friends trained with Marshall and Scala. I'll have to ask them. But as far as I know, it's all uh, related to this, the pulse field ablation. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. How about those 14, weeks of dr uh, 14 drinks a week? I'm still uh, hung up on that. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. It's been most interesting. What you did not explain is what kind of operation it actually is when you have uh, ablation or cardio, what do you call it? Cardioversion. Cardioversion. I mean, are you in the hospital for a whole day? Sure. Are you in the hospital for an hour? Uh, do you go back in your car and drive home? I mean, you didn't explain what kind yeah, of Yeah, sorry. We were somewhat limited by time. So we couldn't explain all the details. But the cardioversion, as as I, you know, you may have uh, inferred, is a super quick thing. The actual cardioversion itself is under a minute. And you come into the hospital, you get cardioverted, and you go home quickly thereafter. It's, the sedation is propofol. It's only for, you're put out for just a few minutes. Ablation's a little different. Everything, as I mentioned, is done through the veins. It's, we usually use general anesthesia now because it's just some better experience for for, uh, for, for patients, they don't move. Procedure times have gone down dramatically. We are doing atrial fibrillation ablations now in 90 minutes. These used to take hours and hours. Um, it's 90 minutes, it's under general anesthesia. We do discharge people home the same day. Um, if they are first case in the morning, they can go home by the, the same evening. But in a lot of cases, we'll watch people overnight, just take it easy next morning, make sure you're feeling okay and send them home. So that's sort of a rough outline of the cardioversion versus uh, the ablation. By the way, the watchman is very similar to the ablation in the sense that it's general anesthesia, and we the procedure times may be a little bit shorter even than that, and we do tend to watch them overnight, just for an observation. And the restrictions are very minimal. It's just don't overdo it with the groin site. Nothing to do with the heart. Thank you for a very interesting program. Um, 
I think about the ablation as really um, treating the symptom, right? I, I think about it as there's a, an electrical impulse, right? And the, the purpose of the ablation is to prevent that electrical impulse from actually affecting the heart and creating the heartbeat. Is there any work going on or what is the status of work in terms of um, preventing the actual symptom? from sort of stepping back and saying, how can we prevent that electrical impulse from actually taking place? Because I think one of the things I've learned about ablation may not be true anymore, is oftentimes they last for a certain period of time, and then they have to be repeated. Correct, and so just answering your question sort of in reverse order, in terms of the reason why atrial ablations have to be repeated in, in some people, it's multifactorial. First of all, as I showed you, the sort of bedrock of this is creating areas of the heart and rendering them electrically non-conductive. But, you know, un maybe fortunately or unfortunately, people, you know, it's not like you're dealing with a silicone chip. So when you disrupt those circuits, you're dealing with a biologic system. The tissue is trying to reconnect. It's, it's, a, it's an active, a dynamic process. And so as the years go on, these connections are reformed over those lines, so to speak, that we drew, and that can cause a reconnection and a recurrence of atrial fibrillation. Coming to your point about why don't we just, why do an ablation, just stop AFib? Well, it's a not so simple because AFib is really a downstream phenomenon that can be caused by many different things. It can be, like I mentioned, a polygenetic channelopathy, a channel dysfunction that you inherited, a multi-gene kind of problem where there's a dysfunction in the channels that can cause atrial fibrillation. It could be something as simple as too much alcohol use, which also has a direct atrial effect. It could be that you have untreated hypertension, diabetes. Believe it or not, cyclists, professional cyclists, who have a very large heart, they have an athletic heart because they have high stroke volumes, they have a five-fold increased risk of AFib compared to the general public. So there's multiple different ways that you get to AFib. It's atrial stretch, it's the channels, it's non-cardiac issues such as sleep apnea, putting strain on the heart, all of this causes the AFib. So yes, I agree with you that going upstream and treating the predisposing cause is important, but unfortunately once you have AFib, it's, it sort of has occurred from all these reasons you end, up, you end up with the same condition and the best way we can treat it is to try and keep these signals away from affecting the rest of the heart. And one of the most frequent cause is age, fibrosis related, age related fibrosis. And we haven't figured out a way of treating age yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Next. Ac actually, you kind of led into the question that I was going to ask because this was such a great presentation for like the modal uh, age here, you know, over 60 or something. But what about young athletes? with, um, uh, you know, who do have like an enlarged heart and are at greater risk. Is that why we have AEDs? Um, you know, that's a great point. And it's, so in particular, a, there's a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's actually very prevalent. Some, you know, right now they say it's one in 500. It actually probably could be more like one in 200. And that's when the, the bottom chamber, the ventricle of your heart is very muscular and thick. And that's a condition where a lot of people don't know they have it. And when you look at all those famous athletes that dropped dead on the court, particularly with peak levels of exercise, or they were taking substances that they shouldn't have been, it's the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that got them. There's a lot of controversy as to whether they should screen everybody, every kid who plays sports or not. They do it in some countries. In America, it's just not efficient. I don't think it's feasible to do that. But there are clues you can get. The EKG is typically abnormal for example, in a pediatrician's office. Since we're talking about atrial fibrillation, the hypertrophs, these people with these big, thick ventricles, they are more prone to atrial fibrillation because the pressures are so high. Their atrium is a thin-walled structure. It tends to stretch and go into atrial fibrillation. But it's a catch-22 because they are particularly sensitive and they really need the atrium to work properly because you got to fill that thick ventricle. So because they have a thickened ventricle, they're more likely to go into AFib, but they're also less likely to tolerate the AFib. They do very poorly with it. So those are people that we ablate very early nowadays because they do very, very poorly with AFib. But coming to your point with AEDs and so on, it's the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's a ventricular problem 
that mm -hmm. typically causes sudden death in athletes. Any other questions? If not, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mitch and Maury and Bob for their wonderful... Uh, Andrew, we have one more. We have one more. Okay, I speak too soon. Yeah. Um, you left me a little confused, even though fabulous presentation the last time and this time. Last time you were very um, strongly recommended that no one take aspirin, especially over age 60 and 65. And yet tonight you're talking about taking a baby aspirin. That's if you have the Watchman device. So basically after you have a Watchman device, you have to be on a baby aspirin. And I will tell you that when, you know, we were overusing aspirin, you know, sort of put it in the water and whatnot. But, you know, the data has shown that if you don't have a cardiac condition, there's no role for aspirin. So, for example, in all those studies that showed that aspirin was no use, they excluded people who had, and as Dr. Dreisman will tell you, if you have a stent or you have some kind of uh, cardiac device in, you, like the watchman, you do need to be on a baby aspirin uh, going forward. So, uh, nuance there. It's not, we don't like aspirin. It's just not for everybody. Thank you. We said no aspirin for primary prevention, people who don't have right. coronary disease, but for secondary prevention, documented coronary disease, device in heart, aspirin, multiple other causes, aspirin is extremely useful. All right, Jennifer, we're good? Okay, so again, uh, thanks to Mitch and Maury and Bob for their time tonight and their expertise, and uh, this is pretty incredible, huh? For those of you that want to uh, take a walk on the wild side, we have these little uh, devices from uh, Cardio Mobile, and uh, we can, uh, it'll give you a screenshot anyhow of, of if you may have AFib. But again, we're not here to diagnose, we're only here to kind of demo this. I also want to remind you that the third and final uh, episode in our little mini series here will be held on May 23rd and it will be uh, all about cardiovalvular disorders, correct Mitch? Cardiac valve, Cardiac valve disorders, okay. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, get your heart checked out. Take care. Thank you.